Thank you. So um, two years ago, a colleague and I set out to explore the often intricate relationship, relationship between motivation and performance in a performance culture. And we did that by interviewing 11 Danish top athletes. And what we found was that often the use of extrinsic motivators undermine intrinsic motivation to a degree where it turns high performers into low performers. And what's scary about what we found is that this is not only in the world of sport. This also applies to schools and to business. So we wanted to understand what really drives talent. So I want you to meet one of the first people that we interviewed. Um, this is a picture of Danish boxer Mikkel Kessler's all-time greatest kick. Kessler is a four-time world champion, and out of 49 pro fights, he has won an impressive 46 fights and has been defeated only three times. Now, one would think that Kessler got his all-time greatest kick in one of the 46 matches that he won. But actually, Kessler got his greatest kick in his fight against Joe Kalsagi, one of the only three fights that he lost. I don't want you to get the wrong picture here. I mean, Kessler likes winning. He doesn't dislike winning. He doesn't hang his head in misery if he wins. But to Kessler, there's one thing that's far more important than winning. To Kessler, there's one motivational driver that surpasses all other, motiva all other motivational drivers, and that's the call of duty. He feels that entering a boxing ring imposes a moral obligation to do your best. And in his fight against Kalsagi, Kessler and Kalsagi didn't do their best. They did far more than that. They made each other, each other better, they created a memorable fight, and they set a new high standard. And in the words of Kessler, that night, no one went home disappointed. I also want you to meet Danish tennis player Frederik Lykke Nielsen. On July 7, 2012, he and Jonathan Mary won the, the Wimbledon doubles final. And that was, without comparison, the greatest achievement of his career. But it wasn't his greatest kick. On the contrary, winning the Wimbledon doubles final sent Luc de Nielsen on a downward spiral, fueled by people both inside tennis and outside tennis, who clearly expected him to now focus solely on doubles. And their analysis was clear. By focusing solely on doubles, Luc de Nielsen would win more matches, he would get higher rankings, and he would earn more money. So why wouldn't he want to focus solely on doubles? But the thing is that Frederick Luc de Nielsen doesn't play for the glory or for the accolades or for the money. He plays for the love of the game. And he's, he thinks of tennis as not a cutthroat competition, but as a spiritual journey where his prime obligation is to express himself through, um, through tennis. And he thinks that sport has absolutely no relevance in society were it not for the spectators. So he feels an obligation to go into court and do his very best and interpret tennis in a way that may inspire the spectators. And what happened when he won the Wimbledon Championship was that people began to question, why are you not focusing solely on doubles? But the thing about doubles is that there are too few types of shots and less court to cover, so you can't really express yourself when you're playing doubles. And that is why Frederick Luc de Nielsen um, thinks, of, thinks of himself as first and foremost a singles player. But he also found himself in a situation where he had to defend that choice. So he found himself suddenly playing singles matches to win and playing singles matches to show the surroundings that he was a singles player to be reckoned with. And in that process, he lost his love of tennis, and he lost himself, and he had to spend years trying to, to rekindle his love of tennis. And in hindsight, he concludes that while winning the Wimbledon Championship may have been the greatest achievement of his career, he and his tennis would have been better off had he not won. 
Lykke Nielsen and Kessler are what, are what I call prima donnas. They are one of four archetypes that are featured in an archetype model that I have developed. And shortly, I will just briefly describe each of the four archetypes. And based on experience, this is, going to, this is what is going to happen in the next few minutes. I will briefly describe each archetype. And from up here, I will have a clear view of your reactions. I will have a clear view of the joy or fear in your eyes as you see your colleagues, co-workers, employees pass by your mind's eye. And you will easily recognize each and every archetype, and when I'm done, you will have categorized every single person you know, except for one. And then you will think to yourself, well, I think I can recognize myself in at least two, maybe three, maybe all four archetypes. And then you will think, that must mean that I am a highly developed, very complex human being. I am beyond categorization. <laughs> and I'm so sorry to spoil that. That is not the case. I'm not going to question whether you're highly developed or complex human beings, but you're not beyond categorization. So when people think that they are beyond categorization, they often misunderstood what I mean by an archetype. What I mean by an archetype is, what is your primary motivational driver? We go to work and we feel lots of motivational drivers. We are complex human beings. We go to work and um, try and do good work. And sometimes we go home feeling energized and inspired, and we feel the strongest possible degree of motivation and meaning. And that is what defines your archetype. Those are probably not the days that you experience the most. The days that people tend to experience the most are days when they leave work feeling a moderate degree of motivation. That was a good day at work, someone brought cake, it was an okay day at work. And sometimes, and I hope that is not too often, you will all have left work feeling deflated, feeling demotivated, and with a lurking sense of a loss of meaning. So the first type of types of days are the days where you are in sync with your archetype, where you abide by your primary motivational driver, where you feel the strongest possible degree of motivation and meaning. The last types of days are typically days when we are forced to abide by motivational drivers that really don't motivate us, where there's a mismatch between your archetype and the management's choice of leadership style. So what is great leadership for one archetype can be devastating leadership for another archetype. And what leads one archetype to perform at a very high level can lead other archetypes to underperform. So let's take a look at the four archetypes, and feel free to stand if you feel that I'm describing your archetype. <laughs> the first archetype is um, the prima donna. Kessler and Frederik Lykke Nielsen and tons of other people. Prima donnas consider work their calling. They feel a personal obligation to serve a higher purpose. That higher purpose may be anything from education, health, customer service, democracy, justice, to creating memorable experiences that may inspire other people. And with that calling comes a personal obligation to try and reach for the highest possible standard, or preferably set a new highest standard. And when they succeed in doing that, when they succeed in, in, in reaching the highest possible standard or creating a new highest standard, and at the same time feel that they made a difference for the higher purpose, prima donnas don't feel motivation. They don't feel happiness. What they feel is existential meaning. And existential meaning is an incredibly interesting motivational driver. Because existential meaning is the one motivational driver that can never be extinguished. It is a continuing source of meaning and motivation. And existential meaning is also the source of grit and perseverance.
So existential meaning is what sees prima donnas through hardship on their way to reaching the highest possible standard and serving a higher purpose. So their primary motivational driver is serving a higher purpose, making a difference for the sake of a higher purpose. The second archetype is the introverted performance addict. Introverted performance addicts are the classical nerds. They love to sink their teeth into a delicious, juicy, impossibly difficult problem. And preferably a problem that is so difficult that they have to think outside, their, outside the box in order to solve the problem. And when they succeed in solving the delicious, juicy, impossibly difficult problem, they get an introverted performance addict kick. And they celebrate by throwing an introverted party. <laughs> introverted parties are parties where you see your coworkers or employees holding a cup of coffee and just silently nodding complacently. <laughs> and they're having the greatest party of their life. But then, in a short while, they will get itchy and restless, and then they will go hunting for a new, delicious, juicy, even more impossibly difficult problem to solve. So they are highly creative, highly innovative, and, um, and they, their primary motivational uh, driver is to solve problems of, of um, increasing difficulty. Now, my guess is that you also know a couple of people who are extroverted performance addicts. Oops. Extroverted performance addicts. Extroverted performance, performance addicts are highly competitive people, as you can see. Um, they are so competitive that if there is no formal competition at work, they will invent their own competition. And then they will go around comparing themselves with others, and then they will get a kick from realizing that they are leading the competition that they themselves invented, invented, and that they didn't care to inform other people that they were participating in. <laughs> they are extremely goal-oriented. They get stressed out if there is no goal. And I like to compare it to that wonderful Monty Python sketch called the Silly Olympics. There's a discipline in the Silly Olympics called the 100 yards for people with no sense of direction. <laughs> That's an extroverted performance addict without a goal. So they need a goal in order to perform. And they get energy from comparing themselves to others because if other people take the lead position, then they get the energy to push themselves into the lead position. So the comparison is just what gives them the energy. They are um, the classic um, rainmakers of the organization. They create the measurable results. And last but not least, I guess that we also, here today, have a few pragmatists. Pragmatists get a kick from doing good work. Only they need someone to define what good work is. They need standard operating procedures or evidence-based practices or frequent feedback in order to know that they are actually doing good work. And then they also need work-life balance in order to thrive and continually do good work. And then they have a secondary motivational driver, um, and that is to serve the work community. And they serve the work community in two ways. One way is to place themselves in charge of the party committee at work. So they arrange parties and special events and they bring cake to work every Friday. That's one of the ways that they contribute to work community. Another way that they, con that they contribute to work community is by, is by um, inventing their own standard operating procedures. If they feel that that a standard operating procedure is lacking somehow, they, ha they hang up notes in the workplace with their own self-invented standard operating procedures. So they might hang up a note in the cafeteria saying, your mom doesn't work here. They may also hang up notes in places where they have absolutely no business at all. Like the female pragmatist who, who hung up notes in the men's room saying, 
please stand closer, it's shorter than you think. <laughs> so, that's their way of contributing to the work community. Now, we need all, work, we, we need all archetypes in the workplace, but my point is that workplaces in general tend to favor two of these four archetypes, the extroverted performance addict and the pragmatist. Because business and management practices is mainly based on, um, on hidden assumptions about employee motivation. And one of the hidden assumptions is that employees are equilibrium-seeking people. So, a vast number of psychological theories and motivation theories and leadership theories are based on the notion that people are equilibrium-seeking people. Pragmatists are equilibrium-seeking in the sense that they need work balance. They are just balance-oriented people. But extroverted performance addicts are also equilibrium-seeking people. Because what you do when you set a goal is that you create an artificial tension. You say to people, so you're here and your goal is here, what are you going to do about it? And then equilibrium-seeking people will have an inclination, an inclination to, to reach for the goal in order to restore equilibrium. And management practices that are based on an, on a, on an assumption that people are equilibrium-seeking people are also management practices that widely use um, extrinsic motivational drivers. In introverted performance addicts and prima donnas are not equilibrium-seeking people. They are attention-seeking people. They thrive out outside their comfort zone. They get their kick outside their comfort zone. When you have to reach for the highest possible standard or set a new high standard, that takes place outside of the comfort zone. When you have to solve a very complex creative problem, that also takes place outside of the comfort zone. But workplaces are based on an equilibrium bias. So we tend to favor the equilibrium-seeking people. So management practices I keep pushing the wrong button here. Management practices are widely based on hidden assumptions about employee motivation that are true for some archetypes, but not true for other archetypes. And what happens if you treat people who are intrinsically motivated and tension-seeking with management practices that are based on an assumption that people are equilibrium-seeking and extrinsically motivated? What happens? is what we call crowding out. Now, I'm not going to uh, give you a very long theoretical explanation of what crowding out means. So the only thing I will say is that crowding out is what happens when you use extrinsic motivators because it undermines intrinsic motivation. So extrinsic motivators tend to undermine intrinsic motivators, m motivation for people who are intrinsically motivated. And just to explain that to you, I would, like to meet, I would like you to meet a third person of the 11 archetypes that we interviewed for the new book. We also interviewed Rikke Müller Pedersen, a Danish swimmer. And we interviewed her six months prior to the Olympics. And then we asked Rikke, what is your all-time greatest kick? And she didn't think twice. Instantly, she said, well, that was three years ago, the World Championships in Barcelona in 2013, the semi-final. That's where I got my greatest all-time kick. Because that day, I reached technical perfection. I had control over every fiber of my body, from my, left little, from my right little finger to my left little toe. I swam like a dolphin. And it was technically perfect and aesthetically beautiful. And that's my greatest kick. A couple of minutes later, she just sort of casually mentions that that day she also set a new world record. And so we asked her, well, didn't that affect your kick experience? And she said, no, I don't swim to swim fast. That makes no sense to me at all. Um, I, don't, I don't swim to win. What I do want to do 
is to show people that there's a connection between swimming fast and swimming technically perfect and aesthetically beautiful. So my hope is that a couple of years from, from now, when I'm retired, people will be watching a YouTube clip of the semifinals in Barcelona, and they will scrutinize it because they will want to know how did I how, how did I set a new world record? And then they will realize that I did that because I swam technically perfect and aesthetically beautiful. And that is what my contribution to swimming will be. I hope that my contribution will be to heighten the technical and aesthetical level of swimming. That is why I swim. So we asked her a second question. When have you, feel, when have you felt the most demotivated? And she said, oh, that's easy. That's right now. Six months before the Olympics, swimming has never been more meaningless than now. Because three years ago, when I set my world record, a goal was forced upon me. And I understood that my goal was to go to the Olympics in Rio and set a new world record and bring home a gold medal. And since then, my life has been measured in tenths and hundreds of seconds. That is not who I am. That is not why I swim. So swimming has become entirely meaningless. And it is so meaningless that I am seriously considering retiring before the Olympics. But I've come to the, conclu but I've come to the conclusion that I can't do that. I've spent thousands of hours doing what I love the most, swimming. So I owe it to myself to go to, to go to Rio and swim and see if I can succeed in finding meaning in meaninglessness. Now, judging by the results, she didn't succeed in creating meaning in meaninglessness. She didn't set a new world record. She didn't get a gold medal. She came in last in the final. And we've talked to her after the Olympics. And she says, it's still meaningless. And I'm seriously considering retiring, but I can't. Because I've loved swimming all my life. And now I can't feel that love of swimming anymore. So I have to go on swimming until I can feel the love of swimming. And then I will retire. That is crowding out. That is what we do to intrinsically motivated people when we use extrinsic motivators. So my mission is to um, to ask people to explore the hidden assumptions of management practices in order to prevent crowding out and in order to create workplaces where we treat intrinsically motivated people as good as we treat extrinsically motivated people. Because if we don't, we will experience a great loss of creativity, we will experience a great, lo a great loss of talent and innovation, and we will also experience um, a lower standard. So please go home and look into the hidden assumptions of your business, business's management practices and make room for the prima donnas and the introverted performance addicts because they deserve it, but more importantly, society as a whole deserves it. Thank you.